Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the ACS Forum for this week. Our speaker is Professor Marcelino. <laughs> So good afternoon, yes, uh, I just proposed to say something because there was an empty, uh, empty uh, moment, an empty moment. What I'm going to say is maybe not new for some of you, but for most of you I think it will be, or uh, at least to some, to some extent. And uh, it will be more or less, so it will be a little philosophical, huh? but, uh, so it will be more or less comments on these three uh, um, quotations, one of DDD, so you don't have to uh, mess up the la parole l'art, so the, the wall of art with the democratic agora, one of Foucault, where the eye was not always already intended for contemplation, and the question of Nancy, what is the gesture of the Lasco painter? And uh, in fact, it's, it is the, uh, the book that Martin and I published uh, in Defense of the School. Uh, that is a little bit the background of what I'm going uh, to say. And as you, as at least some of you might know, is in the book we try to explain why, according to us, the school uh, is not only a democratic invention, but perhaps one which in a way is more radical than the invention of democracy itself. So one which materializes the belief that there is no natural destination and that the world belongs to nobody in particular and therefore in a sense to everybody. And in the book we try to indicate the main operations, radical operations of the school, which can be summarized as an operation to consider everybody as a student that means suspending the ties of the family or the state. Secondly, the operation of suspension, putting temporarily out of effect the usual order. The operation, the third, of making a certain kind of time, free time. Fourth, the operation of making something public, putting it on the table, the profanation. And fifth, the operation of making attentive or forming attention. And so we also try to indicate how school from the very origin up to today has been subject to all kinds of tactics and strategies to neutralize or instrumentalize or tame uh, the school. Uh, of course we are also aware of the devastating critiques of the school as being something like a prison or a camp. Uh, there is a machinery, a banking machinery, a colonizing machinery, an outdated technology, and uh, so on. But so our idea is not that um, uh, we should that that um, the school, uh, as we know it today, is scholastic in the sense that we try to elaborate. And so the idea is also not to engage in a restoration uh, of the so-called traditional uh, school. But we do believe that it is worthwhile to unearth the radical and revolutionary operations of the school as a particular peda pedagogic arrangement and practice of making things public and gathering people and things in order to think about its reinvention. Now, what I'm going to do today is not so much going directly into this analysis and defense of the operations of the school, but do that in a kind of indirect way. Uh, I call it a kind of exercise in educational uh, thought, uh, which made, might broaden a bit the reach of the thoughts we present in the defense of the school. And it is, uh, I will take up uh, uh, a hypothesis that uh, Martin and I have already explored a little bit in a presentation in Berlin, in uh, ESER, that, um, and which is also behind the idea of the defense of the school, that the school is something like the untaught of philosophy and that maybe philosophy, at least in many of its forms, is maybe one of the first attempts to tame the school, to tame the radical or revolutionary character of the invention of the school. Um, and it is maybe interesting to refer, we have been discussing in this Friday seminar, Arendt, 
that Arendt in her lectures on political philosophy indicates that uh, philosophical schools and Plato, uh, we begin with Plato, always um, uh, relate school to the authority of the founder. Uh, so that there, there is a kind of particular idea of school which is related to an authority of a founder like uh, Plato or another uh, famous uh, philosopher. But what I want to present here now is, uh, uh, so related to this defense of the school, is a reflection on the relation between philosophy, education and caves and offer some uh, uh, thoughts about the difference between a philosopher and a pedagogue. Uh, this elaboration tries to pay attention to the school as a topos in the sense of place huh? and takes therefore also into account topical experience. experiences. So topical means pertaining to a place. Or to say it differently, school is also the name of a place that allows for particular experiences. And as I will try to show, this topos always seems to be related to the presence of walls, <coughs> vertical or horizontal walls. So, discussion about uh, philosophy or, or, or the relation between philosophy, education, and care. Uh, and uh, maybe I should say, for those who don't, do not know that, <laughs> that I have so personal relation to Case, going to visit uh, Case, but that this was actually in discussions that we had uh, with Martin together that uh, came to my mind that I think it would be different also about Case and relations between education and education. So there is of course one clear connection between education, philosophy and Case, uh, which, is, uh, which is the one you all know, <laughs> so, indeed, to the present day, the movement of enlightening and liberation as ascending conversion uh, that is so powerful imagined in Plato's uh, allegory of the cave has been and still remains very attractive both to philosophers and educators. Notwithstanding the radical critiques that have been addressed at Plato's claims, even the accusation that he offers the seat of totalitarianism, the imagery of education as the liberation from the darkness of the cave, and I quote one of the commentaries, to discover individually and with others the freedom that may come if we travel into the light remains very present. And of course, this imagery includes, includes the duty of, for the philosopher to return into the cave for liberating those that means most people that are captivated by the shadows. So it is therefore a philosophical story about caves that in the first place affirms the role of philosophy and the necessity of the presence of the philosopher as educator without whom it would be impossible to get out of the cave and realize just society or true society. So the liberating, that means the educational and maybe also political role of the philosopher is something that the philosopher takes up as a kind of heroic duty, we could say. Heidegger famously said, the philosopher who returns in the cave exposes himself to the risk of death. And it is clear that some of this aura of heroism remains part of the attractiveness of being a philosopher and an educator. So Plato's story, so I don't think I have to recall how to explain this, huh? I think all of you will know this kind of uh, uh, yeah, image, let's say. So P Plato's story offers a particular fabric of enlightenment, education, conversion and liberation. The story which has, which had and still has a tremendous impact. Indeed, you could maybe say that philosophy and philosophy of education seem and still seem explicitly or implicitly to find in Plato's cave allegory their common inaugurating story, founding their own necessity and especially the necessity of the presence of a guide 
an educator, or in Heidegger's word, a befreier, a liberator. And it is just just to just refer here also to an, uh, an Anglo-Saxon analytic philosopher huh, who is uh, saying, who is referring to this need of the uh, guide, uh, Stanley Cavell, uh, need, need, the need of the guide huh, who has to go back to descend back to the people huh, uh, because we, after all, huh, are telling them that they, down there in the cave, that they don't know what they are saying and so they need us in order to get to the knowledge, to get out of the cave, to get to the, to get into the life. So it is very clear that in this philosophical story, the cave is valued negatively. It is a place you have to escape from. So the cave is not, is not the womb of life, it's no refuge, it's no place of ritual, but in fact it is simply a prison. So the story offers a scenery of impotence and of necessary transcendence. Men, women, chained in darkness, trapped in their in sheer appearances, who on the hand of the philosopher, so on the hand of the philosopher and not the artist, the artist which is the one who <coughs> So the artist is the one, in fact, who is making the projector. So not the artist, but the philosopher on the hand of the philosopher, uh, who breaks the chains and turns them around and it makes them ascend to the light, leaving the cave behind and going to the light, uh, to the light outside. So the conversion being, in fact, a return to the world out of which men women had felt into the darkness of a disastrous condition, huh? being chained, looking at sheer appearances. Now, I think that this philosophical cave story forgets, obscures, or even tames what is at stake with the emergence of scholastic education. So this is also a story about education, huh? a story about being educated as being turned taken out of the darkness of ignorance, going to the light of knowledge. And so it's a story about education as a conversion. That this forgets what is at stake in the emergence of scholastic education. And that it delivers the homo educabile, so the human that can be educated, you could say, so I, I deliberately not use the notion homo educandus, so the one who has to be educated, but the educabili, that delivers the homo educabili to the custody and the tutelage and the voordeur of the philosopher. So, uh, in, in defense of the school, at the end of, in defense of the school, you already uh, relate to a kind of alternative or other cave story, which you could call an educational cave story, and not a philosophical cave story. So, a story that invites to reconsider the way we conceive of education, of school, and of philosophy, questioning precisely this fabric of enlightenment, education, conversion, and liberation that constitutes Plato's philosophical story. And this educational story of the cave is directly connected to the story of the beings that enter the cave to paint on its walls. The scenery here is not one of impotency, but of potency, so not one of transcendence, but of imminence. This story, so it is about huh, the cave paintings, to see here. Oh, no, that's, that's the other one. But it is about this kind of thing. I come back to this cave paintings. This story knows many versions also. Uh, it received also attention from philosophers, philo philosophers, but mostly from writers and artists. And the version of this story, of the cave paintings, 
the version that interests me is the one that takes into account the phenomenology of the cave and of the cave experience. That means the spatial and temporal experiences related to making these paintings and the gestures of making these paintings, as well as the difference between the way in which a text and an image speaks to us. So, because seeing is not the same as reading and listening. So, it is also a version that interests me that doesn't reduce the caves directly to symbolic places or to sanctuaries and that does not trace the activities carried out within them, so for example these paintings, directly to cultural or religious practices or norms. One so that sees the act of entry to the cave and the paintings themselves primarily as movements and gestures with the hands instead of as symbolic actions that are immediately labeled in terms of their meaning. So this story is clearly related in some way to the story of the emergence of art. And it is interesting in this context to refer first to an old story about the emergence of painting. <coughs> and this is the story. This is this one. Uh, so this refers to uh, a story that is told by Plinius, by Pliny, uh, the elder, uh, who explains that painting, that that began with a Corinthian girl, the daughter of Butales, who traced a line around the shadow of a young man. Uh, that is what you see here. The shadow of the pets. Uh, uh, so she was in love with this young man uh, whose image she reproduced before he departed for distant lands. And she did that by tracing the line cast by his shadow on a wall lit by a lantern. And remark, it is the similar, it is in a way the similar condition that Plato uh, is showing in the light that is making that the shadow is on a wall. Uh, is projected on the wall. Here, so, uh, but, but uh, Plinius uses this as the analogy for the situation of the first painter. So, Butada's daughter here creates a drawing, a line that attests to her inseparable attachment to a shadow. And her focus on the shadow can be understood or could be understood, just as with Plato's prisoners, as the forgetting of the true being, the clinging to an illusion or to a substitute for the true reality, in case her beloved one will be elsewhere and she just has a shadow, not the true, the true lover. However, rather than focusing on the result, the outline of a shadow on the wall, it is more interesting as Hagi Keenan suggests to consider the act of painting itself as a new gesture. A gesture that in fact demonstrates a response to an event as well as a certain disposition. Both the specific way that access is created to a world as well as the way the painter creates also a certain relation to him or herself. So I, go, I don't go into the details of Keenan's argument here but uh, he points out that the actions of the Corinthian girl must not be seen as an attempt to replace an absence with a new form of presence, but rather as an attempt to create a new place between the opposite poles of presence and absence. So, as an act, it is something that opens up a kind of in-between. And here there is a very important thing Namely that in Plato's cave, the shadows are not seen as shadows. They are not seen as shadows. We just look at the world, we don't even know that they are shadows. We just look at them. They are not shadows. Yes. But here, uh, so the, the, those in the cave do not see the shadows as shadows. So they are not subject of attention. 
they cannot distance, you know, the people in the cave cannot distance and relate to them uh, uh, in this way. The girl, however, does not capture or hold on to the presence of her beloved. Rather, he says, uh, Keenan says, she captures, captures her absence, the shadow itself, and hence her separation from her beloved. So what she captures on the wall is the absence, is the shadow. Which, and it is the shadow which engenders or makes possible a new relationship also to her lover and to herself. The line that she traces around the shadow is born of an act of creation. So it is not so much a case that she is projecting a personal vision onto the wall, but rather she responds to what she sees, to something that presents itself to her, and it is, uh, it is a case of this in-between space this is, which is being uh, opened up. So you could say the painter, the first painter, uh, reaches out her hand to the world, but to the world as it appears. So it is not here in this story uh, of the painting, not the philosopher, but the painter who embodies the possibility of an openness to the truth of the visible. The truth of the visible huh, to the truth of the shadow. It is not a philosopher huh, but it gives the truth of the shadow to the painter. It is she who makes it possible for the implicit presence of a line to assume an explicit form and to, sh to turn to show itself as a line and as a shape. So that means that the painter unlocks the dimension of the visible that was previously hidden. The visible is no longer simply what the eye perceives. It is no longer the pure facade. The painter uncovers or discovers the world, discloses the possibility of seeing the world as that which is being seen. And that means that here she can in fact see the world a second time. She can see the world once more. Of course, in a specific way, but you can see the world once more. And I recall that um, Comenius called his uh, or, or this pictus, the, the world in pictures, huh? precisely, you know, he called it precisely this, huh? the world once more, or the world again, the second time. And that means that this opens the possibility of a second beginning of, and I quote here in Chilean also again, so that it offers the possibility of a second beginning coinciding with a human look, a liberated gaze, that has itself released from the shadow of brute existence by learning, and I emphasize the notion of learning, by learning to see the world as a reflection of its own image. This liberation is not pointing to a transcendence, or light, <coughs> or cake, but to imminence. Now, this is the story eh, about the, uh, the invention of the painting. But now it is not difficult to relate this to the man that entered the cave and made the drawings and paintings that have been discovered in various caves of southern Europe, and that uh, in various scales of southern Europe and meanwhile uh, worldwide, in fact, that are seen by many as the first manifestations of <coughs> art. Huh? So the gesture of the school painter, as Nancy said. So I just show you here uh, image, some images out of, I had some part of the, this wonderful movie of the uh, Herzog about the, the, the um, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, the Bilder of Vergessen Träume, very wonderful, wonderful film. Uh, where, so he, it is pl plenty of images uh, that, uh, that are found in the Chauvet Cave uh, in the south of France. These images seem to be 30,000 years old, more or less. And they have now found older ones in Indonesia in the cave about 40,000 years uh, old. And so these are really exceptional, huh? exceptional images that you see uh, 
mainly eh, of animals, not so much of, uh, of humans, mainly of animals, but many, and these are the ones that interest me specifically, many of hands. Yes. Uh, so you see here, hands. These are all for the Chauvet cave, yeah. but this kind of hands that you have here. And these are the ones from Borneo. This is the one of uh, the recent ones, 40,000 years uh, old, so even older. Yeah. But you see, it's a similar kind of uh, with the hand on the, the hand on the wall. And there are two kinds of them. Interestingly, yeah. so there are negative hands and there are positive hands. So the positive hands is the ones that the children still use make today. So you put your hand in the paint and you put it on the wall. So that's the positive hand. Uh, very, it's very simple. <laughs> you put, this is you go back. This is, this is simply simply the paint, the paint that you put on the wall. But interestingly you have also negative hands. And so the negative hands are the ones that are made. They suppose that they are made uh, by the fact that you take the paint in the mouth and that it, that it, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, how do you say expire? Or how do you say spit, 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 spit the paint uh, on the on the wall. So you see, these are the, these are the positive ones, but these are negative ones. So these are negative ones. What kinds of uh, so these are these are the things that interest me. These paintings that are made there, uh, and they can be seen as manifestations, I think, of man as being um, as a being that is capable or that becomes capable in a certain way of shaping his world, of the human precisely as an animal educabile, huh? a being without natural destiny, uh, and. In this way, I think, or sorry, looking at it in this way, we can further clarify, I think, the specific register of representation, the specific gesture of monstration, of showing something, and the specific experience which we lose when we only look at these kind of pictures, which has very often been done, purely as religious or symbolic practices. So you have many interpretations of these paintings, but they immediately go in trying to understand what they are. So to relate them to practices. So there are all kinds, for example, of very sexual uh, interpretations of the paintings that they would re relate to the relay sexual relationships between jet, jet, all these kind of things. So, but I don't want to look at them in this way, not directly, at least, in religious or symbolic practices. Now, in this story, where the man is, enter, man is entering the cave to paint on the walls, uh, we don't see, so, the return of man to the light of eternal truth that shines behind his back in the cave of Plato, huh? But instead of uh, that, so that man enters the cave instead of fleeing out of the cave, and he creates light with his hands and, and casts the light ahead of his hands, light which is also put onto his hands. It is it are these illuminated hands that show their capacity to create images, including an image of the hand themselves, together of these images. Uh, and it is precisely in these that, that interest me. An image created by a being that now also becomes the viewer of what his hands have created, which is not simply an object or a tool, but precisely an image. So you could say that this, this is the first time that man truly sees himself and sees the world think about the creation of the painting uh, in, 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 in this way. Yeah? So the eyes of man, think of the quote of Foucault, yeah? the eyes of man were not by nature destined to contemplation, to thought and intention, but it is these handmade images, what is made by the hand, that also open our eyes to the world like nothing else. In a certain way, 
It is this doing that create our contemplating eyes. They make both the world and ourselves visible or perceptible in a new way. So a French uh, uh, writer, Jean-Paul Jouary, suggests that these paintings were not possible because of certain capacities that were acquired and present, but that it is the way around, that it were these practices that made that the capacities developed. So he, he, the, 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 the title of his book is not <coughs> the man, man created art, but art created man. So, l'art et l'art créa l'homme. This is the other, just the other way. It is not because we are human, human, he says also, that we are longing for aesthetic pleasure of looking at these, seeing, just seeing these paintings, but it is because we create the images that such feelings, which are, I cannot go into that, but I think it's very interesting to see that here in Stark it is about an aesthetic relationship, so not an ethical, not a political, it is about an aesthetic, rela aesthetic relationship sorry, to, to something. It is because we create that such feelings can emerge and can become so-called human. So seeing the world and oneself always means seeing from a distance. But it is important to notice here that the image here is no longer a question of a mirroring in the water, because of course you can say you have images before also in the water, you see images of yourself. Of you can see the images of yourself in the eyes of the other. It's also a reflection that you have. But here it's not like that. It is precisely the reflection of an image on a wall. It's on a wall. The hand produces before the eyes the subject of the first sight. It makes it makes something visible, and it does so in full autonomy. You could say. In this cave, the hand. Is not shopping or carving or taking or caressing. It is not performing acts of survival, of hunting, agriculture, agriculture, fishing. It is not making objects. The purpose and the use of the hand have changed. It is now a plain apply, applying paint to the wall. And this painting to the wall means that the hand also marks out a distance. The hand is placed on the wall and the paint is sprayed, sprayed over it, or, or it is immersed in paint, as I said, that is immediately and literally presented to the eyes. And so here I recall the quote from Fernand Deligny, so not to confuse the wall of art, this wall here, with the marketplace of politics, the Agora Democratique. And I come back to this very important remark. So the act of making something visible, of visualization, cannot be limited to a desire to say something. It is also a form, maybe it is that also, but it is also a form of making something common, you could say. So as such, I'm not concerned with the symbolic meaning of the painting, but with the sense and experience of a gesture that allows us to exist as beings with the capacity to take ourselves by the hand. Not as masters of the universe, but as beings who have precisely undergone, experienced a learning or an education, I would say. And this capacity, this capacity does not refer to an essence or a destiny, but to a real experience of a present time. A rift between past and future, we have had that also. So it is, it is really, you could say, really a hand-holding in the literal French sense of the word for now, le maintenant. Le maintenant, that is, that is precisely taking by the hand, at, at, at the hand. And so now, present is here in the three double sense, you could say, 
and this sense of a, a, a gift, huh? something is given to us, but also very importantly of a pre huh? being in front of us, before us. So it is this idea of the world once more. But it is a pre something is before us, but it is always also in a relation, so also a kind of inter -esse. And so here you could say maybe this presence of maintenant hmm, is a kind of rupture between past and future. So you see that what is interesting to me here is not the symbolic, ritual, religious meaning of these paintings, but the experience and experimentation which are related to the gestures. And I think we should not forget that they, they are related to this very, very particular topos, the cave, which is not a prison, nor a hell, nor a temple, or an uterus. Above all, it is the site precisely of suspension, of separation or departure. It is departure or separation from a world of daily living and of the eternal cycle of natural life with its rhythm, rhythms of day and night and of the seasons. It is the place of another spatial and temporal experience, which are testified by the traces on the wall, a place so to say, without place. And maybe I can recall that that was what Foucault called a heterotopia. It's a lieu sans lieu. It is a place, but it has, in fact, no place in the usual world. It is the place where humankind, with the torch in the hand, because these were made, huh? the torch in the hand, in a certain way becomes master of day and night. There is no longer only time for living and time for working. There is now time for attention and contemplation too. And I quote Latour, I take him a little bit out of context, and say, you find here, the here that I am now quoting is not the here that Latour is talking about, but I quote Latour, the staging of a scenography in which attention is focused on one set of dramatized inscriptions. So the being that here is at once creating itself and being created is not the being, as in Plato's case for example, huh, that fell from paradise or from the heaven or of ideas and was then handed over to strange powers larger than himself or defining him as incapable or weak or living in illusions. It is a being that now finds the courage and I think that's an important element, the courage to enter the cave and to allow him or herself to be formed. Here, the relationship in which men and women are bound by the power of specific reality transforms into a visual relationship relationship that offers the possibility of rebirth, the possibility to relate to the self and to the world and start interacting with that world once more, so anew. Man stands facing a wall onto which he himself casts light, not so sunlight, no divine light, but simply the light that of the torch of his hands. And we should also remember that the wall is not a mirror. The wall is not a self-reflective mirror. Because you don't see it's not reflecting in that sense. In that sense, the image of the hand on the wall is maybe the first non-speculative self-portrait of a human being. Images are painted here on walls. That means they are without horizon and they are beyond the realm of normal time. It are images of animals and set of the hands and so on. So the hands are no longer instruments or objects. Their manual power is temporary, or certain manual power is temporarily removed or suspended. And the hand now becomes available as a shadow. It becomes 
available for contemplation and attention. The animals which are painted, uh, the animals with this beautiful The animals here do no longer appear as a prey for, or a predator, but they are removed from the cycle of reproduction and survival. They are naked and beautiful. You're not the idea of a horse or a bison, like Plato, the idea or something, but an image that has been made and that removes the horse or the bison from its natural or social environment exposes the animal. The, image offer, the images offer the possibility to contemplate and to think, to explore new relationships with respect to the self, others and the world at a distance. At a distance which is not the distance of a mirror, it's not the distance of the mirror but of the wall. Not the kind of distance also from the top of a mountain that evokes reverence for the greatness of the world or that sparks the imagi imagination of conquest you know, to be on the top of a mountain and see the world there the, here the world is simply at the distance of the hand it, you cannot see further than the distance of the hand and, the top. Uh, and also let me here again briefly recall a very early text of Bruno Latour on visualization and cognition where he precisely points towards the thinking with the eyes and the hands. And where he invites us, so it is a little bit, huh, just a side note in a certain sense, huh, where he invites us to not relate the specificity of modern science to the existence of cultural differences. Yeah, so that the West would have invented the, uh, the modern science because of some cultural uh, difference with other cultures or to the happy existence of special minds but as he says to the explanations that take writing and imaging craftsmanship into account that take into account the hands and the inscriptions that they trace on flat surfaces creating an optical device presenting the world before the eyes so he recalls also that thinking is handwork. He recalls Heidegger's hand phrase that thinking is handwork. And what is in the hand and at hand are precisely inscriptions, which are in the first place material and not conceptual or mental, mental sorry, representations. <coughs> so maybe here it is, you could say, maybe here we have something like the origin of man's experience of an ability to act and also to dream in relation to the world. And of a specific experience also, and that I think is a further element that I want to mention, a specific experience of togetherness. So here we are now not together as participating in a ritual, as being part of a family or a tribe or a state, but we are together as a public that is viewing something on the wall together, so that shares the place, shares the walls and what appears on the walls. And that what is on the wall cannot be grasped itself, but can get names and we can talk about it. And you can maybe see here this story, because I want to recall that this is just a story. It's like Plato's cave, cave story. Huh? It's just a story to try to think in a different way about uh, school. Huh? So, what cannot be grasped, but get, get names and talked about. And you can maybe see how in this story the cave turns into a pedagogical space where the world can become present for a second time. Where an experience of ability can appear, that means taking our relationship with respect to the world into our own hands. Not in the sense of dominating it eh, or exploiting eh, it, eh, but in order to be able to establish new relationships towards it. 
can begin anew with the world. Where also a particular experience of sharing a world can be made. So the sharing is here, what we share is in a certain way the space, the wall, the image. That is what we share. Not, not, the, not the ritual or the family or whatever, not the blood or whatever. So that is what we share. Sharing a world can be made and where that world can now become the focus also of attention. Something that we can interact with, that we can relate to, about which we can speak and maybe also want to speak because of its beauty. That makes us speak, maybe. Uh, so it is a place that offers walls on which the world is made available in a certain way. Uh, walls that create a time and space beyond the realm of normal time and the natural environment. Uh, so I, you could relate this, I think, to the operations that I mentioned in the beginning about the school and the suspension of, of, the, nat of the natural order, the act of profanation, the animal, for example, that is not just something for, that we hunt for survival, but has its meaning in some practices, but is now just as an animal on the, on the wall. Now, uh, let, let me uh, add a few things. Two more pages. Uh, so that um, so we don't need in this in this story we don't need the master philosopher who leads the way out of the cave into a transcendent world and tells us that we don't know what we are saying. But we can find some help from the pedagogue who goes along the way to the cave. <laughs> So I, I mentioned huh, that the cave is not home. It's, it's, a, it's in some way it's a very uncomfortable context. It's not it's not a nice not such a nice comfortable place. So you need some courage to go into the dark cave. So the pedagogue is the one huh, that uh, is taking you, that going along the way, that is pushing you a little bit, huh, offering you a hand to go to the cave. So the pedagogue, and you remember that the pedagogues of ancient Greece were precisely the slaves who brought the children to school, taking them out of the house, and the poikos, and out of society, the polis, to go to school. And maybe we could also understand the teacher not only as the one who projects images on the wall, which is maybe about artists, but also transforms the wall, you could say, that is the last point that I want to make to, that transforms the wall into a table and introduces words, thus naming the world, making it in something that we can talk about, uh, such that the world is made available to a being that is also made available to itself, available for contemplation, for study, and exercise, and so on. And therefore, uh, I want to add, so second, the second, second story, you could say, is not a story about the cave, but a story about the table. And here I just want to quote from... That's the pedagogue. I want to give a quote from uh, Francis Ponge. Uh, so, for whom, it's a, it's a French poet and writer. Uh, one of the very, very few, very, really, very, very amazingly few people that have been writing about the table, which is such a very important uh, thing. So the table, and so he, but it's, it's a writer and a, po writer and a poet, so it's not, it's not a kind of uh, scientific uh, analysis. And, but I think, he, he, for me, he made a very, very, very nice uh, remark about the, the table, so when he says that, huh, first of all he says that the table is precisely the wall that becomes from horizontal, from vertical, becomes horizontal. So that's the first thing, the table becomes, the wall becomes horizontal, that's the table. But then also he makes a connection, that is the, the quote that you have here, between the able in table, 
and the Latin adjective habilis and the adverb habili, which may means what may or may not be, qui peut être, qui peut être, what can be. And so it is what we have in the English language. Huh? It is about what is manageable, reasonable, huh? doable, reliable, but able. Huh? Able, being able. And so, of course, huh? etymologically, etymologically, they say that table is traced back to the tabula, to the tablet, huh? the surface. But in Porges' version, table becomes the support, the support, the, the foot of a wall, which is the able. So the T able. So the T that is beside that is that is for him huh, the, the table. You have the support of the wall with the table. That is what he's saying here. Huh? Table is only the support. It's little more than a suffix, a suffix which with its support column. But come to think of it, this suffix, however, means something else itself. It shows the pure possibility for the subject to which it is assigned, the possibility to be according to the radical. It qualifies the subject to which it is assigned as being possible according to the radical, capable of the capacity to be radical. In short, to obtain table using the suffix is it is standing with its back against the support column, the T that pictographically defines it. And so we could say that table is only the substantification, so the materialization, you could say, of the pure ability. That is what the table, the table is about. Table as a support of pure ability is an invitation, he says, to make marks to draw lines, so to become, you could say, a blackboard, or a board again, or the wall once again, as something that itself does not move, but towards, towards which you move or are drowned, that carries and by which things are supported in their ability. So in that sense, and I come back now to the, you know, the remark of Deligny, that we should not co cause, confuse the wall of art with the Agora Democratique. Eh? So taking this idea also to the horizontal wall, we should not confuse the table of the school with the table of negotiation. The table of the school is the table that makes free time and allows for the experience that you are able. It is the one to trace on. Or to and to present something, to present the world, the one to make public, profanate, to make attentive. It is the table of the pre-esse, to be present and interesting, the table of writing, the table of reading. So not the table of negotiation. So in Latin you have the the, the, thing, the, the Latin term is osium, free time is osium, the table of negotiation, the table of the negation of osium. The table of negotiation, that is a table of dialogue, of affairs and businesses, of disputes and interests, instead of inter esse. So the stories that I told you, the story of the table, the story of the cave, are different, of, offer a different fabric of enlightenment, education and liberation than the one Plato offered. In these stories, caves, walls, tables, pedagogues, and teachers seem to contribute to the shaping of a particular time-space-matter arrangement, a place without a place, a time without a time. And it is this arrangement that maybe we could call a kind of school. Its operations imply suspension, profanation, contemplation, attention, all of which are connected to a certain temporal and spatial experience and an experience of ability and of imminence and by which we are gathered in a very specific way. Of course, these are only stories as I have said and there are more stories to be told, but it could be an invitation to think about the school or to help also to think about the school in a different way, not as a camp or a prison, not as a home, or a workplace, not as a parliament or a church, not as a place of initiation and socialization, but as the place out of place and the time out of time of the homo educable, 
where one can relate to and deal with the world, not in the first place to be armed for the daily struggles of life, but in order to find maybe some references, some navigational aids for our existence uh, in the night of times. And I want to close with a quote from Michel Serre, or a quote or a reference to Michel Serre, who states that Plato worked with the image of enlightenment as the exit out of the darkness of the cave toward the sunlight of knowledge. And he says, still in the enlightenment, darkness is the metaphor for ignorance. But he says, today he says, this image of being in the light of the day, where the sun shines on me, is rather the metaphor of ideology. Whereas the image of the starry night with little lights coming from everywhere, or sorry, where little lights come from everywhere, light up, extinguish, offers maybe a better image to be used not only for science but also for our ex existential condition. And maybe you could say that school is a name for a place where we could again get attentive to these little lights that disappear when exposed to the abundance of the presence of everything and the presence of too much light. That's what I want to offer you. And maybe just one image. Is this image coming out of an Iranian movie? Uh, by Samira, not by you Samira, but with Samira Maknalaf, the blackboard. And so it is the, it is the teacher huh, with the blackboard uh, uh, on, on, on the road. And maybe that is a strong image of the school. Maybe you could say that is a kind of, if, if you want to have a kind of essence of the school, if you want, you could say this is the image. Blackboard. So, a wall, <laughs> a blackboard, uh, empty chip. That's the essence of the essence of the Thanks for what I wanted to <laughs> I was wondering whether um, you uh, elaborated in contrast to Plato's library of the cave and um, the elements that you touched upon, like the torch, which was in the fire in the cave, there are other things that for Plato the sun would also be a very important part, but it doesn't really come back in the cave as, as you um, have created, and the sun for Plato refers to the truth. But what would truth be in your cave, or where would truth be? Is it in the cave? Is it outside? Is it in the texture of the painting on the wall? I think you can relate it to the to the story of the, of the painting, yeah. so that the, the truth is in the shadow, yeah. not in, in the relation to the shadow, not to the, to the, to the idea out, to the idea out. Yeah. But the, so the, the, yeah, the, 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 the point for me was to, of course, it relates to personal interest. Uh, it's a kind of technical, it's a very technical story. But I think it is important to, to, to try to. I think that this, this, this Platonian idea is still very, very strong. Yeah. It's very, very strongly present. of people living in illusions, captured in illusions, and we have to save them by bringing the light of knowledge. Yeah. They are living in ignorance, and we have to, to, to offer them. And so this story, I think, can, can, can bring in something else. And for me, also very important in the, the aesthetic dimension. <laughs> the beauty. So not the morals. Yeah. In Plato, it's always also immediately about ethics and politics. 
But here it is in the first place about relation to it's a kind of beauty, it's an aesthetic relation. Bring you back to the concept of illuminative hands where I lost you for a minute because you called it like pushing the light in front of you and I couldn't relate to that concept too well. Can you explain that again? No, so the, the idea was simply that you go into so it is really about a very concrete experience of going into a cave. So how how are these things made? They are really made by people that go with torches into caves. So these paintings, very interesting to see that these paintings are made not at the entrances of the caves. So people have really to go far away into the caves, or well, went into the caves far away to make these paintings. And so you have the light of the torch. And the, the light of the torch, that's more or less, yeah. that's more or less this. Mm -hmm. And so when you, you throw your light, light also on your the light is also falling on your own, on your hand. It's not the light of the sun, it's not the light of the um, sun. It's interesting to see also that these paintings, the, the, there are some, when um, Herzog is referring to that, that the paintings are made in a way that if you go along with the torch, and they use the, they use the, 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 the materiality of the wall, so that if you are going along the wall, that it is like, the, in, the, they are moving, like the animals are moving. So they call it the first cinema. Mm -hmm. It is like you have kind of <coughs> you know, the, the animals start to to to, to, you know, to go, but it is made. Huh? So it connects to the idea that you need courage to sort of uh, create as well, because because you need to go, you know, you need to. Uh, to pass the more obvious level, right? You need to go in deep enough to be able to do this and create. What do you mean by deep enough? Well, if you say like the illuminated concept refers to the idea that you need to have the courage to go in and do this, then these two are sort of interrelated. Is that wrong? Yeah, you need, to, you need some... You know, it is not a hospital... It is, as such, the cave is not a very hospitable place. It's maybe cold, it's cold, it's dark. Uh, it's often wet. Uh, so it's not a place where you uh, look for comfort. How do you relate the courage you need to go to inside the cave to the courage you need to think for yourself? A scout would say. Is it the same kind of courage? That I don't know. I, I would not say that. So the, the only courage that I would, I would like to relate it to, it's like, first of all, I think there is a, it's very interesting that these hands, huh? it's, in fact, it's a crazy thing, eh? that, that children still do that. It's really, it's like a gesture that goes through time. So it's putting that and, and, do, and, and, and doing that, so that's the first. And then the other is, yeah, but, I think parents still feel today that if you go, have to go into school, you have to push your children a little bit because it's not a place where you want to know what's going to happen in school. And it's maybe something scary you want know, to be in school a little bit or be on your own and maybe out of the normal world to push you a little bit. You need a little courage. You know, to I think that is what, what I would say is there. The pedagogue. And the pedagogue is maybe also the one who keeps the place, it's not the teacher. The pedagogue is the one who keeps the cave, who makes that the cave remains a cave and does not change into a home or in a temple or in a theater or in something like that, but remains a cave or school. school. The teacher is, I think, the one who speaks about what is on the, on the, on the table or on the, on the wall. Or on the, uh, and would you say that today there would still be a lot of caves, or can we also create caves? I think now, so 
Uh, there was already a lot too, too late huh, that, uh, that we started also some <laughs> late. But I think the, the, uh, these, are, these, are more, these are images of schools in case. In China, you have some real schools in case up to today. So you see here. That was a school. Yeah. So here, I think, so what is, what is now the question for, what was a very strong question for me, and so is you have tablets. <laughs> You have the tablets in the, in the school, and you have also this, of course, in the, in the evidence. So you have, can you call a screen a wall? Can you call the screen a wall? And if that is the case, so here you have the mobile, the, so the evolution of man huh, to go to the smart, huh, to the smartphone. You can, and so here, so here also you could say you have the world at hand. Huh? You have, you have, in a certain way, it's also a kind of yeah, the world being at the distance of, of, of your hand. But I, I think there are main differences. It's not, not the same as the situation that uh, I'm trying to really describe. But I think there is something here also of, of an experience of having a world at hand. I think there is something there, there like you have it there or a very strong there. experience. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I think it is something. You don't, you don't need the courage to do that. You know? No, you, you that don't need the courage. Strong, you know? yeah, it's yeah. Just there are differences. There are real, real differences. So it doesn't push you towards. Uh, of, of, of attention that you use, because uh, some authors in, in history have argued that attention is precisely the outcome of enlightenment and all the processes of subjectification that uh, came along with it. And so, uh, in a period of enlightenment with its emphasis on education, it was precisely in that period that people needed to become attentive for things that surrounded them. And in your talk, it seemed to me that attention was kind of different. That it preceded the enlightenment, or that it can be uh, considered as an alternative, or as a, as a kind of antidote uh, against uh, our interpretation of education that came out of enlightenment. And so, I'm not sure how uh, the concept I left, of I left, attention out, I left out the whole part on uh, so Jonathan Grary. He has uh, had a whole, uh, on this issue, especially on this issue of attention and uh, <coughs> of attention since the since, since enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But I used here attention in a very, let's say, straightforward, simple way. So in the sense that, so the so if you look at the, the history of painting, the history of painting that by by making the drawing around the the shadow. Mm -hmm. The shadow can become something that you can see as a shadow, so you can be, become attentive to it. Mm -hmm. So, in, simply in that sense, not in the sense that, that so in, there the, the attention becomes something that you need really to, uh, you know, in the modern times because there are so many things uh, around that you need to focus attention on. So, there is of course something of that there too, but I think it's still different. Yeah. And I want to recall also, I'm not claiming that this is the true story. Eh? So it is a story. It is like it is like yeah. it is really like Plato's cave story. It is it can help you to think maybe in a different way about what the school is and what is going on to the school. So it's not so much about whether the the, 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 history, the story of Plato is true or not true or whether my story or this story is true or not true. But maybe it is can, it a story or a gesture? That's, that's, I think that's a story. <laughs> I think it's a, what, I, what I do here, I think, is offer now. I think it's a story. But you'd like to be, you'd like to consider it as a gesture. Maybe. Yeah. 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 And to some, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And I recall an expression of you that you once said, you start stories before you go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is true. That's true. <laughs> that's the thing. That's that's that's, that's, a, that's a thing with stories. Yeah. <laughs> when you sleep with me, yeah.
But I like it's the story. Yeah. But you can you can try to tell stories that are exciting stories. <laughs> <laughs> But this, this, these cave papers are so fascinating, in a way so fascinating and so crazy. Because so you the first so now the first swans are the old swans are apparently forty thousand years old, you can imagine. But Lascaux, for example, that's much later. So Chauvet is thirty thousand thirty two thousand, Lascaux that's twelve and twelve thousand, that's even young, younger. But what is so amazing is that they find the same kind of paintings. The same kind of paintings. So there is all kinds of hypotheses about how is that possible? Has there existed a kind of art school that has existed for ten thousands of years where these painters were going to? Because it is not easy. So there are all kinds of experiments to try to reproduce them. So to, to, to make them, it's incredible, difficult to make them. It's not, not just I go in and, and get the hand, okay, that, that, that you can make easily. But these pictures of these Byzantines, and they are in places on, on, on the sailing, on the sailings, and so on. So how how have they make it? Maybe. And so they are consistent over, over over many years, over different places, before they found them only in the south of, of southern Europe, so southern France and Spain. But now they meanwhile find them everywhere. Uh, so it's fascinating. <laughs> In each mark. <laughs> Could I ask a question? Um, it's just about the what you said about static image um, as a scene from mobile. And you said that you pass a torch uh, along the wall. It looks as if they're mobile. Um, but in general, they are static images in the sense that they have been created but as one particular ceremonial moment or one particular big moment um, and they were probably created as part of some kind of ceremonial or, or ritual that we don't know but it seems to, be, to have been a big thing they weren't going in every day to, to do different uh, drawings or all over the place it seemed that these were special kind of drawings so what I'm saying is that it seemed to have been something they were doing, it was something that was meant to remain. And um, that's a little bit different from the Plato's cave images, which are presented as essentially mobile, essentially not something that the prisoners actually created. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, something more like what you see behind, you know, a kind of mobile images created by other people, and therefore creating a different set of circumstances. Um, I just wonder if you could say something about that. No, but, but I, I, so I, of course, the, the paintings of, of um, Plato's cave, they are not made, well, they are made. They are made by the artist simply by taking in now the image. I have, I, have, I have the object. <laughs> so then the, the artist is here, what you see called the cave dweller. That is in a certain way the artist who has the, ob the object and then the light. The, light the, the images are made by the artist in a certain way because he takes, he makes a kind of, yeah, makes a kind of image already mm. of, the, of, the, of the, the concept outside. But there, there are interesting studies about shadows huh? that in fact the idea that, some, that an image would be stable is something that only can exist since, the, since modernity. Because before there was no light that, would, that was stable enough to offer you the possibility of half stable images. Because if you have torches and candles, you will never have a connection. It will always, there will always be a kind of, uh, of, of movement. So you will, have, you will not have images that are really uh, stable. Now about, there are all kinds, so they have uh, the Chauvet cave. Probably it will go open, it will be open this year. That is what they planned. So it was discovered at the end of the 90s. And then they, the French government, they installed a whole scientific center to investigate these paintings because you can really visit just nothing of what there is to see. And this 
in really incredible what there is to see. And so there are all kinds of uh, people that are investigating these, uh, these, uh, uh, these paintings. And for example, they are trying to, to reconstruct the history of the painting. So how they, they can read, so they really, yeah. they, for example, they, they look at how big must a person have been to be able to make these paintings. In how many times, so how is the painting made in one time or is it made in different, is it different times, is it real and all these kinds of things. So there are all kinds of hypotheses of uh, yeah, investigations about how they are. So that's also the reason why I say I am not really referring to that research. I'm telling a story, <laughs> not not not. Re I think this interesting. This in this research is very interesting, but I'm not directly interested to. to to say that is true or not, or not true. But there are, you know, that, that's for example also with this element, with the element of the table. Huh? So what Francis Ponge brings in, of course, I said it's a, it's a poet. Huh? And etym etymologically it is not correct, apparently, huh? to relate table to able to do that. But I think it is, it's, he, he yeah, he, he enables to look at the table in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a particular in a particular way, and this is really, if I may, look at the historians. <laughs> this is really the story to write. Huh? It's a story about the table, and it's a story about because that I could not mention also. It's about the table manners. So the manners to deal with the things that are on the table, to put things on the table, and to, to the table man the manners of the table, to deal with, 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 with the things. Um, but again, this is uh, it's a kind of uh, it's more trying to show the possibility of a different way of looking. But your, your idea, sorry, sorry, your idea is that the the education moment is a kind of a contemplative moment in some way that you're looking at the hands or whatever that this is particularly significant. And um, that seems to be a, um, a, something that's very static, something that's very important, you know, uh, as distinct from treating um, things that may be changing and so on. Yeah, I think an important element is the image. Huh? It's, that's that's the, it's the creation of the image. Because of course you can see your hand also like that. Huh? Yeah. But seeing your hand like that is different from seeing it as, an, as an, precisely as an image. And also the image is on a flat. flat huh? It's flat mm -hmm. surface. And therefore I refer to Latour because I think there is a really an interesting connection to uh, to that, so the development of science, he, he understands the development of science precisely by the creation of this, or the, the use of this, this different things are represented on a flat surface, and because they are there, they can be things that are normally not brought together can be brought together and can, in a certain way, also travel. For example, they can travel through time, <laughs> they still, they still, they still are there. But then also, you can, yeah, you, you, can, you can make them travel. Yeah, you can make them travel from one place to, to, to another when you have the images, the visual, the visualization. Yeah. I think in your story, you stress you know that these images are very old. They maybe put forty thousand years ago. What is Maybe I missed it there, but what is the importance of the the oldness of the images? Does it do you take it into your story? No, no. Maybe that's pure. That's purely because I'm fascinated. By it. <laughs> so it's not. It's yeah. not maybe yeah. not so important yeah. that they are so old or something. But but it, what what struck me is that in the in the cave story of of, of so I said I am a caver. What I missed in the stories of the cave of, cave of Plato is that it seems that he has never been into a cave. <laughs> so 
So the experience of time and place that you have in the, in the cave is completely absent from what he's saying about, about the cave. So that you are out of time, that can be really a very strong experience in the cave. We have no reference of any time anymore. And that is very, very strong experience. So that is completely absent out of this Platonian story. And the same is absent of, yeah, you have the walls. The wall is something, yeah, it is something that you cannot move, <laughs> something that you are confronted with, something that you touch, that you try, that you try to touch. And so, so it was this kind of, and then I came to the, you know, to the cave painting, the cave painting themselves, so that, that they also thought. Not, um, Second question. Um, in many, uh, I don't know that many stories, but ideas on, on education, there's something about you know, um, an element of uh, uh, something greater than yourself. Something in, in, in the Plato, it is the sun, which is much greater than the people and what people experience in the game. Um, there's other forms of greatness, which is related to being you know, part of a group or a community. That's what, is there in your experience, in your you know, idea on, on the cave and, and the, the hand, is there a great, something greater than yourself? And in which, which elements is it? Or do you just say it's an experience? Or is that is also, for me, that was very, it's very interesting to and it's very interesting and important to precisely try to say that you what you have here is a kind of a kind of autonomy or mastery which is coming about, which is emerging, a kind of mastery, but which is a, it's a very limited mastery. It's not it's not the, it's not the one who sits on top of the mountain and says the world is mine because I can see everything here and that is mine. So the, the, that is not, that, or it is also not the one who sits on the top and sees, wow, the world is so big. Uh, so I can only, I can only do this for the, uh, for the majest, majesty of the, of the world. It is precisely, you could say, the birth of a certain autonomy, of a certain mastership, so of a certain emancipation. So, but not, 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 not domination, not, um, not mastering every, everything, but there is a certain distance that is possible to the world and it has to do with something that I do with my hands. So, there is a possibility to act that you could say is discovered there. And I found it interesting what this man Jouari was saying about art. Huh, that so very often we think about this man invent, invents art. So he has to have. He has also already to be at a certain level in order to be able to make these paintings because he must have a concept, concepts or whatever so to make these things. And he, he reverses that and says that it is the making of these things that made it possible that our eyes became capable of contemplating something. So our eyes were formed with what we did with our hands. And yeah. there is something but, but uh, it could take me 20 minutes to develop that. But it's very very interesting thing by Stigler. Is referring to that that is maybe happening again today. And that is why I came to this. That that there is that there is also again a kind of seeing hands and maybe also a kind of autonomy. Or mastery that is here, huh? that is that is uh, that is uh, present here uh, again, which has to do with the fact that I can add something 
by this uh, here. I'm using by using my hands and see it, there is there is some the eyes and the hands are again at stake here uh, and so but I must say I'm also not out of that that it's a, I think it's a difficult issue here it's a difficult Are you yes? Because now you are trying to to understand the school eh? and trying to understand some uh, I don't know how to say basic operations eh? that are eh? in this. Are you not intrigued to 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 I don't know how to say but make distinctions between very different practices? Uh, for example, uh, that's, that's very obvious, uh, uh, making art, eh? uh, especially if, if, if you connect it to the social cultural pedagogy that uh, have very different kinds of educational practices. So you could say that, that the school is, is the practice of the table. Mm -hmm. eh? And if you refer to, to uh, the practice of the the hands and the seeing of the hands, maybe is it also is it related to the table or are in some other practices these uh, operation more I, um, in the center of the practice? Eh? Then you could say, uh, for example, uh, the technical uh, I, how to say it, technical ways and making things. Eh? For example, eh? a pedagogy of making. So. Yes, it seems to me that you try to, yes, all the different practices bring to the same kind of operation, and I, I think this is interesting, but maybe there are, yes, it's also interesting to make distinction between very different practices, and are they very different because the operations are combined in a different way, or that they make other uh, operations possible. So I think, yes, even uh, this, this table of negotiation, I think you can look at it from an educational... ...operations. I think a, a, a research from, from a, an educational research can can put forward the, the educational experiences. Yeah, I, I have no problem with that. Of yeah. course, of course, the, the the people that you are talking about, they were learning all kinds of things when they were hunting or when they were mm -hmm. uh, they were also, of course, learning all kinds of things. So this is a what I wanted to to, yes, but, to show but is a kind of particular practice. Particular, eh? yeah. a kind yeah. of particular yeah. practice. So that is why I said it's about it's about school. It's about scholastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's scholastic education. It's about a particular uh, yeah, way to look. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's for sure. I, mean, I don't want to reduce everything to to that. But the starting point was the starting point was in fact this very present story of Plato's yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, which yeah. which is very strongly strong, yeah, very very strongly present yeah. in our you know, in our idea of the pedagogue emancipating yeah. the ones who are catched by ignorance or illusions or whatever and we have to enlighten them yeah. bring them to the light uh, so in fact, telling them that they don't know what they do. So we have to we have to bring the light. And so I think the school is not about this, and the, and the education is not about this. And the pedagogue is not the philosopher that is getting you out of the cave, <laughs> but bringing you in to. You. Keeping you in the cave. So, so, but I don't want to say that everything is related. No, I think it is. Do you know whether there are cave paintings of caves? I don't. Cave paintings of caves? 
The most, well, as far as I know, not. So as far as I know, the paintings are mostly of animals, mostly of animals. There are some of human, uh, uh, human Im Im images, and then that. Yeah. Yeah. Mo mo also, for example, landscapes. Not, 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 not landscapes. So it is very particular. Also, of course, it will be related probably to some. Yeah. Yeah, some, or, although there are also very strange things about these animals, huh? you can they, they have paintings about animals that are not present in the in the area that where the paintings are found. They were were at least uh, forty thousand years ago, or thirty thousand years ago. But they don't find remnants, for example, of the kind of animals that are painted on the wall. On the wall. They don't find them in a very long distance from these kids, they don't find them. So what has this image to do with, with the surrounding or with the you know, all kinds of enigmas about this? In fact, they know very, very little. There's a lot of fantasy about as well. You sort of drew a parallel, I mean, or moved from physical walls towards these digital walls. Yeah. And so to the physical walls, you assign the role as a pedagogue, as someone who sort of pushes, gives you the courage to do things, right? And I could situate that with the cave idea and start. Can I just have your opinion on how that role of a pedagogue would change when you move from physical to digital, because I know some of you are working on that, but I would like some of The question for me is whether, the question is, to put it in a different uh, language, the question, is the wall a screen? Yeah. That's, is the wall a screen? Yeah. Can you so say that the wall, that the wall is a screen? And if it is, the wall would be similar. Then, then you could say it's similar. But, no. but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether you can Neither say Neither am I. <laughs> can you can say that. And there are different either there are but you, you should also make the history of the screen. So the history of walls, the history of the screen. Uh, because these walls, or the walls here, of course, they are not movable. You have to move. Uh, but nevertheless, so that, that means that, that, that you are and it means also that you are free to move. Before the wall. Here, you are simply captured. Right? You, it's not you that. It's not only you that takes it, but it is also the thing that takes you. So you are also captivated by it. By, by. So, so you, can, you can go everywhere. So with the wall, you leave it there, and then you go. You go elsewhere. Huh? So in the end, it might mean that it becomes a trap. <coughs> Because it becomes part of you, so it becomes yeah. tremendously yeah. active. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's very it's difficult. It's a sense of um, encouraging you in a certain way. Because you said, I mean, if you have to go to something that is unfamiliar, it takes courage, right? What if it isn't so unfamiliar, then that layer is gone, and that has an implication not only for the person, but also for the one guiding, right? Because you need to focus on, on different things. It's, yeah. yeah, it changes, and you cannot yeah. completely compare the situation. I mean, I take the point that something which is completely frozen in time gives you an extra opportunity to look at it in structure and, you know, in, in detail and learn from that. Um, I'm a bit puzzled by the screen because even though you put things on it could be your address or something, it's immediately obsolete. You're, you're not able to actually put anything there and kind of remain. You know, by contrast with the, uh, the cave painting or the way you're describing the uh, cave painting. So to me it would seem to be diametrically opposed. The only similarity would be you're able to actually put something on, but you're not able to hold it there. No, no there, is, there is a different thing that is happening, that is happening, that's, that's for sure. 
But the, I think that the thing there is, and there are people that are trying to work on the history of the, sc the screen, and also, and they say the first screen you could say is the is the uh, is the is the painting, which is <coughs> not this kind of painting, but the painting that you can remove. So the painting that you have in the museum, you, you that also you can take and you know, take the painting on the wall. You cannot. And they make differences between painting on the walls and the mosaics, for example, which are on walls. So you cannot. You, and so if you have a mosaic and the image on the mosaic, it's a different relation that you have to that than if you have a painting that is made on canvas and that you can take and that you can move, you can, you can go around and you can take it. Yeah? And here again, you have it's a completely different relation. So there's also a whole history of, of screens and of paintings about what takes you captured and the wall can you, you the wall the painting on the wall can capture you but you can also go away from it. It seems that this thing is increasingly impossible to leave it. <laughs> so it captures you. <laughs> um, Maybe I may, I may I may close with an advertisement. The the that's blackboards. That's blackboards. Okay, thank you, thank you.